it is um, September 24th, and this is our Board of Education virtual joint meeting. And um, I just want to go over some uh, flow uh, with you all tonight. I spoke with both uh, chairs, and um, we pretty much agreed that um, we would um, have uh, opening remarks. Um, uh, before opening remarks, though, we will do roll call, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, and then for each of the topics, uh, one, two, three, and four, we're going to have short presentations by um, whoever uh, was designated to um, do those pr presentations. Um, I have on my list that um, the superintendents would do it, but the superintendents can certainly pass those presentations off. There are no PowerPoint presentations. However, if you do want to uh, share a screen with something that you think would be better for a visual, then we want to do that. Um, these three boards years ago decided that to, we wanted to stop doing PowerPoint presentations because it didn't give the board members enough time to have discussion. Um, and that was the important part of these meetings to have discussion. So um, with that said, um, I want to thank um, Hillary and Marianne for helping me get the flow of this down. And then um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask um, each chair to do a roll call and they will call the, their board members names. You have to unmute yourself and say uh, that you are here. The reason we're doing this is because in virtual meetings, the North Carolina General Assembly um, insists that there be some sort of roll call. It also helps the person that is taking the, our minutes to understand who's present and who's not um, later on when, they, when they're um, uh, creating the minutes. So we're gonna start with Orange County and Chair McKenzie, if you can unmute, and if the board members on the Orange County uh, School Board could unmute so Hillary can call your name and you can t tell us if you're present. Thank you, Chair Rich. Um, so Vice Chair and President of the North Carolina School Boards Association, Brenda Stevens. Here. Ms. Sarah Smiley. I'm here. Mr. Will Atherton. Here. Um, our new board members who have joined us as of July, Ms. Carrie Doyle. Here. Ms. Bonnie Hauser. Here. And Ms. Jennifer Moore will be joining us as soon as she is available tonight. Um, Chair Rich, would you like for me to introduce staff now or hold on that? Yes, please. Okay, tonight um, with Orange County Schools, we have Dr. Monique Felder, our superintendent. Dr. Kathleen Dawson, our deputy superintendent. Ms. Melanie Stowe, our Public Information and Community Engagement Officer. Ms. Sharita Cobb, the Director of Student Services. Ms. Rhonda Rath, our Chief Financial Officer. Dr. Danny Williams, our new Chief Operations Officer. And Dr. Dina Keeling, our Chief Equity Officer. Thank you, Hillary. And Welcome. Marianne, we'll go to you next. Sure, hi everybody, it's great to see you. Um, I'm happy to introduce um, Amy Fowler, who is the vice chair of our board. Here. Ronnie Dossi. Here. Jillian Lacerna. Here. Joel Brown. Present. Dion Temney. Present. Ashton Powell. Here. Wonderful. And we're also pleased to be joined by members of our cabinet, um, Dr. Jim Cosby. You could just go ahead and that name okay. everybody, yeah. Sorry, Patrick Avali, Jessica O'Donovan, Charlotte Banks, Erica Newkirk, Misty Williams, Jeff Nash, Lee Williams, and Jonathan Scott. And we really appreciate you all being here with us tonight. Thanks, Marianne. Um, I'm gonna do the roll call for uh, the county commissioners. Commissioner Bedford. Here. Dorson. Here. Green. Here. Markopoulos. McKee? Here. Price? Here. And Rich is here. And uh, tonight with us, we have Bonnie Hammersley, our manager, um, our, our um, deputy manager, Travis Mirren, our attorney, John Roberts, David Hunt, you already talked with, Jim Northrup, uh, Greg Wilder, Alan Coleman, Gary Do Donaldson, finance, Paul Lawton, finance, Chaz Offenbridge, and um, Kurt Vaughn. So um, that is who we have. And welcome everybody. Um, it's a big group. Um, so we're gonna start with our um, welcoming remarks and I will start first and then we'll go to uh, Marianne and then to Hillary. 
Um, so thank you. Before we start at, uh, at all, um, the county commissioners want to just take a minute to um, thank uh, both the boards, uh, superintendents and staff um, for all of the work that you've been doing uh, to deliver a sound basic education to our children in Orange County. Uh, these are difficult times um, for our children, their parents, uh, the educators and support staff and schools in general. Uh, the decisions that you make today may change tomorrow and trust me at no time you're going to make everyone happy with those decisions. Um, both districts have challenges. Um, some are different, some are the same. Uh, technology has been a challenge. Um, it was difficult before the pandemic um, and it emphasized the inequities for those that have easy access versus those that don't. Uh, and now with the pandemic, it's put on center stage. Uh, today's New York Times estimated there's about 12 million children in America uh, without the necessary tools, technology, internet services uh, to continue their education. And this will likely broaden the achievement gap. Uh, we also call that the opportunity gap here. Um, and the New York Times is saying probably for an entire generation. Uh, the lack of broadband in the county and the policies uh, in place by the North Carolina General S Assembly forbidding counties to deliver broadband service to, his re to its residents is a perfect example of top-down policy that supports large corporations who line the pockets of our politicians while leaving humans, our children, behind. It's no accident uh, that broadband is not a utility in this country. Uh, the BOCC has been aware of this broadband gap for at least two decades. Uh, we've all been involved one way or another to acquire reasonable solutions to help our residents. And this is not a district one or a district two or an at-large issue. We are all deeply concerned with this. And folks, we're just not there. Um, as a matter of fact, it's even gotten harder over the past four years. So the tools that we're left with are limited and they're expensive. And in some cases out in Orange County, they don't even work, they're useless. Um, so what you all have done is a good job of investing large sums of money to purchase and operate these hotspots. Uh, but they still have data caps on them that are controlled by the telecommunication companies. Uh, just this week, the county manager, along with Dr. Felder, um, have, have come to an agreement to amend our CARES Act uh, funding money distribution. We're going to now assist Orange County in purchasing an additional 1,000 hotspots. Um, and that amendment will be on the county commissioner's October 6th agenda to be approved. In addition, both districts have created uh, learning centers and student hubs. You'll learn about them tonight from the schools. Um, and these are for um, children that don't have internet services or a family at home to help them with their daily lessons and technology challenges. Um, again, we just wanna, we want you to know that we understand this is a challenging time and we wanna thank you for your dedication and your flexibility to think outside of the box when it comes to taking care of our children uh, during a pandemic. Um, so thank you, thank you, and thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to hand that over to Marianne. Wonderful. Thank you all so much um, for it's great to all be together and see your faces. Um, we are so appreciative um, of the opportunity to collaborate and work together. Um, I think right now, more than any time, we are so uh, able to see how schools are in fact the hubs of our communities and we knew it but it is evident right now every single day and the support of the Board of County Commissioners and being able to work together with Orange County Schools and within our community has never been more important because we have been able to really focus on what our students and our families need in these times and we are very grateful for all that you do to make that possible. One of the things that is very, um, also that we're very aware of is that equity has never uh, been more important, um, but also that these challenging times in many ways are exacerbating those inequities as Commissioner Rich just shared. And it's not just broadband, it goes beyond that. And so we do and we will share tonight just some unbelievable work that's been done through our Food for Students program to make sure that our food insecurity can be addressed for our students and families. Um, but also, we are focused on how do we support our students academically as well as socially and emotional learning 
and how do we do that for our students, but also thinking about our staff and our teachers and everyone else who is engaged in educating our students. And so as we come together, I think we know there are many challenges right now that we're trying to address every day. And I appreciated the note that what we have to do today compared to tomorrow um, might be different, um, but also that as we begin to come out of this pandemic, which I am an eternal optimist that eventually we will in fact be addressing that, there are going to be challenges that we did not face before, and some of the gaps will be even greater than they were when we went into this. And we're doing everything we can to mitigate that, but knowing that there's going to be a lot of work to be done. And so we'll want to continue to work with you and continue to address those needs. Before I um, hand this off to Hillary, I did want to mention that we also want to honor the life and contributions of Miss Uzel Smith, a namesake of Smith Middle School, who did recently pass away. Um, she came and actually, I believe it was on her birthday last year, to a board meeting and allowed us to honor her. Um, but she's just such a great reminder of what this community is about and how we look at academics, but we're always looking at the whole child and the families. And so I want to just mention her tonight as yet another time, one more, you know, to let her inspire us yet again as we go through these challenging times. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marianne. Um, and I'd let the record show that Mark Markopoulos has joined us as well as Jennifer Moore. Um, and then Hillary, I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, Chair Rich, Vice Chair Price, County Commissioners and County Staff, Chair Wolf, Vice Chair Fowler, Chapel Hill Carborough City School Board, Dr. Cosby, and staff. Orange County Schools is pleased to be here tonight at this group of thoughtful leaders to collaborate around the best interests and needs of students throughout our county. While we're facing a public health crisis that has created new challenges and struggles for so many in our community, we are simultaneously experiencing a reckoning in our county, state, and nation around racism. As a district, Orange County Schools is committed to working transparently through these crises while we continue to educate, feed, and provide a safety net for our students and their families. So thank you each for the work that you do in Orange County and for considering the important conversations we'll have here tonight. Um, may this meeting bring forward creative solutions to benefit our community's children. Thanks, Hillary. And um, moving forward, let's all go by first names. It'll be a whole lot easier, a whole, whole lot friendlier, too. Um, all right, folks. Um, so we are going to move on to our um, COVID updates. And uh, the chairs and I discussed this. It, it worked really well in school collaboration where we let the superintendents um, just talk about um, uh, the updates, and you can see there's A through G, um, and, and they gave us a five to seven minute presentation and collaboration, and, and it, uh, they passed on a lot of information, and um, it, it worked out well, and then we had an opportunity to ask lots of questions. So that's the format we're going to um, try to hold here. We're not holding you to five or seven minutes. If you have to go to 10 minutes, it's just perfectly fine, um, but as long as we can have time for um, a, a robust conversation afterwards, that would be great. Um, so I have uh, Dr. Felder up first, if that's okay, Dr. Felder, with you, if you want to bring your mic on and your camera. And good evening. Good evening, Chair Rich, Vice Chair Price, the entire Board of County Commissioners, Chair McKenzie, Vice Chair Stevens, uh, the Orange County Schools, and Chapel Hill Carroll City Schools, Board of Education, all staff, and everyone participating in tonight's meeting. So with regards to uh, covid updates. Um, as I think about the school reopening in person, I can't emphasize enough that uh, the safety and health and well-being of Orange County school students and staff remains our number one priority. Yes, we are currently in Plan C, which is all remote learning. However, our goal has always been a safe return to in-person instruction. Indeed, we are most eager to do so. As part of the Orange County Schools uh, preparation to return uh, to school, the Board of Education established the Orange County Schools COVID-19 Metrics Task Force. Uh, the task force is comprised of a broad uh, spectrum of, of uh, different people, including students, teachers, classified staff, nurses, principals, parents, central office staff, community members, and a Board of Education representative. The purpose of the task force is um, and functions in collaboration uh, with the Orange County Health Department, but their purpose is to monitor trends 
um, in uh, four, uh, four metrics for four weeks prior to making a recommend recommendation to the Orange County uh, Board of Education. Uh, and so our school board will be determining whether to remain in Plan C for the next uh, nine weeks uh, or to shift to Plan B. Uh, and Plan B is a hybrid or blended model uh, that includes both uh, remote learning as well as in-person instruction. Uh, it will reflect a gradual phase in and will include a 100% uh, remote learning option, uh, what we call virtual academy for families not wanting in-person learning. Um, if we do a uh, shift to uh, plan B, uh, there will be strict adherence to the three W's, which we should all be familiar with, um, wearing our mask, uh, hand hygiene, and social distancing. Next, I would like to invite uh, Melanie Stowe. She's our public information and family engagement officer to bring updates with regards to supervised learning labs and also uh, a new feature that we um, launched and that would be our internet hubs. Ms. Stowe? Good evening. And thank you for the opportunity to share with you. Uh, the needs of our families continue to drive the work of Orange County Schools. Uh, working parents with school-aged children are faced with the challenges of how to ensure their children are safe in a safe learning setting while they're at work. And this is even more daunting for families with low incomes, families who face greater health risk, and families who face inequities and in access to educational and health resources, as well as employment options. Supervised learning labs are the new necessary adaptation of our before and after school programming while we are in Plan C remote learning. The three priorities of our supervised learning labs are to support our families' financial security so that they can go to work, to provide a safe in-person option for students and support the students' educational and academic success, and to prepare for Plan B. We have facilitated a supervised learning lab for a little over a month um, in partnership with the YMCA, and we successfully launched our second supervised learning lab in partnership with Pleasant Green United Methodist Church on Monday of this week. Equity is a district priority, and as we implemented our supervised learning labs, we dug deep to ensure that they were equitable, that they weren't exclusive, that they were inclusive, our partnership with the Y offers um, uh, three different payment options for, uh, for our students, um, including um, an extremely reasonable rate of, of, of $10 a week, um, thanks to an anonymous donor in support of our six-year partnership with the YMCA at two of our elementary schools. Our second lab that opened this week, uh, we dug even deeper and we are in the midst of a global pandemic, so the needs are significant and the spaces are few. And we had discussions throughout the district, which of our students need these labs the most, knowing we couldn't serve them all. So priority for our second supervised learning lab is given to students that are identified as McKinney-Vento or ESSA. So those are our homeless students and foster care students. Thanks to the leadership of our board, and their support of equity. We are utilizing our enterprise fund balance, which is our before and after school fund balance, um, to provide this at no cost, including transportation. Again, we started on Monday, we're at 50% capacity. And um, in the coming weeks, we will open a third phase, which will be at a school. So therefore it will be a licensed opportunity and we will be able to serve families that receive DSS subsidies and we are currently looking into uh, ways to support our staff as we explore returning to school under Plan B um, and staff that may have uh, their own child care needs um, as they report back to in-person instruction and work. A uh, second piece of the equity, and this has already been referenced, is the lack of broadband access and, uh, and the locations of, of which um, in Orange County, a hotspot doesn't work and there just isn't service. And so to meet those needs, we have opened two internet hubs. Um, we will be opening a third one in the coming weeks as well. 
And these hubs are located at our schools where we know there is a, a need um, uh, based on heat maps and based on our own knowledge of, of, of internet access. And so this allows families to um, sign up for a morning or afternoon session. Um, they're welcome to co go to any of our middle and high schools, and there's a number of community spots for, with access and parking lots. But again, equity is not necessarily sitting in a car. Equity is being able to have access to a restroom. Equity is being in air conditioned and, and to be safe. And so we have opened those to provide internet access to our students and families. And we'll continue um, as we as we are looking at Plan B, uh, continue uh, because Plan B does alternate uh, weeks at 50% capacity. And so these needs for supervised learning labs and internet hubs will continue uh, until we are all back in school. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. And Dr. Felder, do you want to continue on with that or someone else? Actually, um, good evening. This is Kathleen Dawson. Hi, Kathleen. Okay. Good morning, Penny. So nice to um, see you. And um, good evening, everyone. And thank you, commissioners, commissioners and board members for this opportunity for this collaboration. And, you know, Ms. Stowe, when you speak of equity, having access to bathrooms and AC and safety, I actually see that as rights to basic human rights. And I think that's um, even beyond equity. It's about human rights, um, that our families should have access to bathrooms and safety. Um, but I do want to um, thank you, commissioners and board members, for acknowledging the challenges that our district is facing, especially when it does come to equity and inequities caused by the di digital divide that COVID-19 has brought to our attention more than ever before. And I do want to thank you for your support and your willingness to fund the additional hotspots that we need. Last spring, we were able to purchase and distribute 500 hotspots at the start of this pandemic. We've since then have purchased and distributed four more addition, 400 more additional hotspots to families with no internet but cell service. And uh, just recently, we put in an order. We're working on 600 more um, hotspots so that we can meet the needs of our families. And we continue every day to get more requests. And I think, you know, there was a question that was raised. It's like, where is this coming from and, wh and why? While there are a number of our families in our community that may have internet access, I think it was mentioned at the start of this meeting that the quality of service is lacking. And so families, you know, initially they, they, they're trying on their own, like to do what they can. But what they're finding is, you know, families who can pay the bills, they have multiple users in the house. They have, you know, working parents trying to work from home. They have, you know, multiple children all trying to access the bandwidth to try to work and learn. And when it's spotty service, that makes it very, very challenging. And so, you know, they're reaching out to us to help us to get better service. We want to go to work, we want to go to school, but lack of service is making it difficult. And what we're finding is that the hotspots we are able to distribute is helping them. But again, there are, as you all know, areas in our um, community where there is no connectivity. So a hotspot won't even help. And so, you know, when um, Ms. Stowe was sharing about the internet hubs, at the same time, when we have over 40% of our families that qualify for free and reduced, um, you know, meals, we have to also think like, what's the reality of them being able to transport themselves to some of these locations that we have created? A lot of our families rely on our transportation to get their students to our schools. And so as much as we're trying our best to provide access in multiple ways, we're, there's still a number of families that we're unable to support. And um, yes, we are expending quite a bit of funds to try to support our families. We have spent over $319,000 just on hotspots and associated services. And in an effort to support our families without connectivity, trying to be creative in how we can get them instructional materials, we have purchased um, flash drives to try to download um, learning um, lessons 
and trying to get those to students and allowing them to work on them and save them on the flash drives and bringing them back to us. But again, this is not the way our children should have to learn. Um, we've also worked on increasing our um, parking lots to make them you know, Wi-Fi access points at all of our secondary schools and parking lots. We've also strengthened the range of um, that Wi-Fi service there. We're in the midst of creating Wi-Fi um, hotspot locations at our elementary school parking lots as well. Um, we have ordered teacher devices that are expected in October because our teacher devices are not um, adequate for remote instruction. They don't have cameras. Um, you know, so then, of course, we had to purchase webcams to support the cameras because as um, you know, we've been trying to get the teacher devices in as soon as we can. And in the meantime, we've had to find alternative ways. We are in the process of a student, um, you know, computer refresh. But as you know, the our vendor and the manufacturer that they were using were put on the entity list by our U.S. Department of Commerce for allegations of violation of human rights and child labor laws. That has um, definitely put a damper on our timeline. As, as of right now, we don't even know when the expected delivery date for our Chromebooks for our students are. Um, so then we have, but because we need them, because of, of the pandemic, we then had to make sure that um, we had alternatives. So we're spending additional funding to rent uh, devices to ensure that every child has access to a device. That is costing us um, over $90,000. The webcams alone um, was over $35,000. Um, teachers, uh, you know, for the safety, because of the, the remote instruction to ensure that they had the most safe access to our virtual platforms, you know, we did pay for the enterprise for Zoom to try to avoid any uh, Zoom bombings and, and um, you know, activity like that, that cost over $27,000. And what we're finding and what we're hearing, because, you know, it's very important to listen to our teachers and to hear what their needs are as well. They're challenged. They've set up, you know, best scenarios as possible, but they're trying to use one laptop to try to see all of their students at the same time, trying to manipulate their um, teaching lessons and the work that they're doing. And that's been very challenging. And so they've requested second monitors, I think, which is only reasonable that teachers have the, the equipment that they need to be the best teachers that we're asking them to be. That's, you know, about $85,000. And once we are able to transition to um, plan B, we're still going to have students that are remote while we do have some of our students in person to support our teachers being able to take on that challenge of doing dual instruction of those who are in person as well as remote, trying to set up the technology that's needed in our classrooms to allow for that. Um, flat panels are costing us over $300,000 um, to be able to connect their laptop device to the um, flat panel when they're trying to use multiple screens. Um, that's going to be over $70,000 just for the docking stations. Um, and, and these are just some of the things, you know, that we've had to expend money on. Um, and more so now than we normally would have because of our um, response to COVID and to ensure that we are trying to do our best in offering uh, virtual instruction. And so since July of 2020, we have expended over $954,000 as a result of COVID-19 and it is continuing to climb. And, um, you know, there, and just so we're clear, like the, our refresh of laptops, that is not included in that dollar amount because that was planned um, previously before COVID. That seems like so long ago. Um, so just to be clear that that dollar amount is not in any of those um, numbers that I just shared with you. So that's just um, a little bit of our technology needs. And, um, but we do appreciate the collaboration in, in going after a longer term fix because yes this is an immediate but our longer term need is access to the internet without it we cannot educate our children to be globally competitive 
um, it is the world of technology and you know if we could band together and fight for that for not only our county but our state it will be imperative um, if we are to do what we're supposed to do in educating our children so thank you for that and I will um, pass back to our um, fearless superintendent Dr. Felder. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dawson. Uh, so the next item uh, providing an update on is the Scientific Analyzing Board uh, that is now known as the ABC Science Collaborative. So this is a, a collaborative that um, Orange County along with Orange County Schools along with Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools, Durham Public Schools and Wake uh, County School System participate in. Um, we're not the only districts participating. Uh, we were the inaugural districts participating. Uh, there are now 40, I believe 40, uh, maybe higher or more uh, districts uh, that are currently uh, participating. But the purpose of this collabor uh, collaborative is to uh, pair scientists and physicians with school and community leaders to help, uh, help us understand the most current and relevant data related to COVID-19 as we make decisions that will uh, help keep uh, uh, students uh, and staff uh, safe uh, when they return to the classroom. So there are weekly COVID-19 uh, in the classroom uh, webinars uh, and weekly meetings with superintendents and members of our team. Uh, webinar topics have included um, uh, uh, the topic of mask, um, exceptional uh, children, uh, the flu and ventilation. Uh, and um, this, uh, the ABC Science Collaborative is currently uh, supporting Orange County Schools with developing detailed uh, plans. Uh, so uh, that would be the update on the ABC Science Collaborative. And at this time, I'm going to um, pass the mic to Sharita Cobb. She's a director for student services, and she's going to talk to you about food insecurities, uh, homelessness, and school nurses. Sharita Cobb. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am going to speak to you a little bit about the food insecurities that we have been working um, with our families in Orange County as of March when COVID hit us very hard. So as of um, September 22nd, Orange County Schools had given out approximately 204,893 lunch breakfast combinations to families and children throughout the school district. We had also given out 35,441 supplemental food boxes to Orange County students and families. And we used 13 different sites throughout the county um, since March to be able to give out those um, food um, items. And we did those in a drop off and or delivery to um, the home, the front porch, um, depending on what the need was of the family. We also um, continue to, as Right now, do our Backpack Buddies, which is a program we offer throughout the school year where um, children are sent home on Fridays with a, a bag of um, non-perishable food items that they can heat up really quickly and have to eat throughout the weekend. Um, that is continued through our social workers who know who those families and those children are, and they are doing um, direct delivery to those families weekly now and or referring them out to community resources. I'm going to speak a little bit about our homeless children, which are con called our McKinney-Vento students. As of tw the 2019-2020 school year, we did have 114 McKinney-Vento students. Please keep in mind that that number is not a complete year's number. Um, as we stopped counting in March when we did um, have to leave schools, um, that number would be a little bit higher. We've already begun to accept applications for McKinney-Vento students right now this school year. We continue to support those children who are experiencing homelessness or food insecurities with food boxes, um, with our um, food program that we are providing the breakfast lunch combinations, as well as staying on top of community resources for food, clothing and housing and partnering with different organizations to provide food boxes. As far as our school nurses are concerned, we are um, an extremely um, grateful school district that has one school nurse in every school building. Um, and those nurses work with our Orange County Health Department um, and they have been working through the COVID um, era, as I call it, on um, contact tracing in Orange County, as well as once we return back to school, they will be helping us with that if the need should arise. They have also been working with us as we develop protocols and procedures 
for our school system around co the COVID-19 and responses to COVID-19, our isolation rooms that we would have in schools, as well as training and support for school staff and protocols and procedures around COVID-19. Um, I guess I will go ahead on. One more thing I have is um, the school resource officers. Um, um, as a part of what I do, I work with the um, Orange County Sheriff's Office and they provide us with school resource officers within our building. We are currently looking at proposing to um, create an Orange County Task Force, which would look at school safety and would be called a school safety task force. And that focus would be on a number of items related to student and staff safety and well being, which would include the student resource officers. Orange County Schools has had resource officers in our school buildings since 1992. And with the school district and the sheriff's office, we've developed a support network for our students and our staff. Um, throughout the year um, and in the summertime, we offer um, an SRO symposium and we've done that for the last three years. Um, and in that symposium, we have covered the role and responsibility of resource officers in our schools, current school and state laws around resource officers, We've covered things like working with students with disabilities, how um, we can work with students who have incarcerated parents, working with McKinney-Vento students. We've talked to them and worked with them around restorative practices. And we've also worked with them and talked with them about working with youth experiencing mental health concerns. Orange County Schools and the Orange County Sheriff's Office are now reassessing the role and responsibilities of our resource officers. And we are looking at our MOU in doing so, so that we can identify what works and what is working. We can identify challenges, and then we can develop strategies to address areas that are identified that are in need of improvement, and then um, put those improvements in place, and then determine um, how we can be of more support to all of our students and our school community. Thank you. Thank you, Sharita. And Dr. Felder, do you think that that uh, ends that presentation? Uh, Chair, Chair Rich, it, it would end this portion. So sure. uh, if, if you want to, we can come back to the budget or if, yeah. would you like for us to continue? No, I think that's good. Let's let's see if there's any questions. Um, so we okay. covered one and two in, in yep. it all at once. And I, I think that's great. Um, so um, if you have a question, there is um, a little hand that uh, icon that you can raise and it would put your name to the top and I can call on you. Um, and um, as you are called on, the icon hand will go down. Um, and first we have um, Earl uh, McKee, who wants to ask a question? Yes, I uh, don't know exactly who to address this to, but I'd like to start off by saying that I appreciate our staff and manager moving forward on uh, providing funding for additional hotspots rapidly. Uh, about two weeks, three weeks ago, I petitioned the board to uh, look at the county picking up the cost of uh, these additional. I knew there was a backlog in Orange County School. I knew there was a small need in Chapel Hill, Carver School Systems. Uh, and I petitioned that the county pick this up as a one-time non-recurring uh, expenditure. Also, uh, at that same time that the county formed a task force to look at uh, addressing the broadband issue because the school system, I mean, it was just mentioned that there are families with no service yeah. and hot spots don't work when there's no service. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question uh, that I have uh, is, is I understand there's 600 uh, that are still needed and how many are anticipated to be needed before the end? Uh, by the email this afternoon, if there were a possibility of a thousand being ordered. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner McGee, for your support. Uh, great question. And so uh, what we are finding is that uh, the needs continue to uh, mount um, for the reasons that uh, Dr. Dawson mentioned, uh, but also because um, family circumstances are changing. Uh, so that is um, uh, leading to an increase in terms of requests. Our staff are now, uh, more and more of our staff are requesting uh, hotspots. And um, in some of our families' homes, they may have a hotspot, uh, but if they have multiple children and uh, they are also working from home and, and tapping into uh, their Wi-Fi. Uh, one hotspot 
uh, is not sufficient. And so we are going to need to circle back uh, and, and provide families with an, some of our families with an additional hotspot. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I have two other questions. Oh, I can either ask those or I can defer till other members ask questions. Okay, Earl, hang on. Let's see if anyone else has another uh, has additional questions uh, before before Earl continues. And I see Mark Dorson. Um, well, that was a great presentation. I appreciate that. I just wanted to follow up on the school resource o resource officer point because I know skimming through the agenda that. Uh, Chapel Hill is also preparing a study committee to look at school resource officers. And I know that the county commissioners talked about that when that came up during our listening session about policing. And so I just think um, while each district will make its own decisions, given that the, uh, there are po policy questions in common and that the school resource officers are all funded by the commissioners, um, that there might be some economies of scale by putting those um, either committee, if not together into one committee, but having some interlocking membership so that, um, you know, we're, we're not three groups, uh, you know, all doing the same work uh, off in silos to have some collaboration on those discussions, at least, um, and, and uh, you know, figure out where the, um, you know, where there are uh, issues in common, where there are differences, and then you know begin to figure out how to reconcile those. And Dr. Felder, did you want to take that one? Well, um, thank you, uh, Commissioner Dorison. Uh, you bring up a very good point, and that's certainly something that, that we can um, uh, look into. Um, I'm sure that there are, you know, areas where we will overlap and, and certainly can uh, work together. And I'm also sure that there are probably some things that are unique uh, to each district, but um, yeah, we are certainly not opposed to um, uh, considering that um, proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Feller. Additional questions? Okay, before we get back to Earl, I just wanted to make a statement about broadband. Um, it, it, the commissioners have been working on this for years and years and years and years. Um, and we, the, the lack of success is not because of, uh, of what the commissioners are doing. Um, the General Assembly does not allow us to deliver broadband service uh, to um, our residents. So even if we were to spend money on putting infrastructure in the ground, we would then have to hand that infrastructure over to a telecommunication company. And we're talking about between 25 and $35 million, which is a tremendous amount of money to invest into infrastructure just to allow a telecommunications company to take it over when they should be putting the infrastructure in the ground themselves. Um, I've, I've been on many committees, uh, not only in North Carolina, but um, in Washington itself and been and been on the, uh, the Hill talking to uh, our senators and congressmen and, um, you know, what I said in my original statement, until broadband is a utility, um, our hands are tied. And we can keep trying to come up with these solutions. And we will. We will keep trying to come up with these solutions. Um, but until we have an understanding that uh, broadband needs to be a utility and be available to every single person that wants it in America, it's going to be hard going. Um, but again, that doesn't mean we, don't, we stop. We, we need to continue to work on it. And, and we will. Um, so I just want to I just want to reassure everyone that this is not new. We know this has been around, and, and like I said, it's probably about two decades now that we understand the disparities, um, and it's 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 been it's been complicated for us, and um, we've we've spent some money on it, um, and it, you know, like I said, the past four years have only gotten harder. It's not gotten easier, but we will keep trying. So. Let's go to um, Renee, and then um, I have Earl up next after that, unless anyone else raises their hand. So Renee? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I very much appreciate what you, um, the work that you're doing for uh, students that, um, that are experiencing homelessness. And I was just wondering uh, the degree of, you know, is the situation getting worse? Uh, are we losing students? Um, 
you know, moving somewhere else? Uh, are we tracking them? You know, just how, what is the gravity of the situation with our homeless? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Price. So I, um, I'm actually going to ask uh, Ms. Cobb to come back on, but I, I can tell you uh, what I what I do know is that um, we are finding that uh, we have uh, families who are uh, more families who are are joining together in terms of living in in, in the same uh, dwelling. Um, so that is certainly uh, on the rise. Uh, but uh, Ms. Cobb, any uh, additional information that you can provide regarding um, our homeless students? So, um, yes, ma'am, you are correct, Dr. Felder. We have, um, we have um, lost, um, Commissioner Price, a few students who have moved to other locations. Um, but what we found is quite a few of our McKinney-Vento students have doubled up with other family and or friends um, to try to um, stay in the area. And so, and we have um, provided some resources for those families as we've known about it um, to try to keep them in the area as well. But um, what we've seen is that they have been doubling up a little bit more than they um, normally would. And we've been working with Department of Social Services in trying to um, provide resources and strategies for keeping them in our district. And you're working with our uh, eviction diversion program as well? Yes, ma'am. Our um, okay. my social workers are doing that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Um, if no one has any a, an additional question, we can go back to Earl. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'll just start by saying that uh, Chair Rich is correct. This is not something new. Uh, my petition the other night was not uh, not predicated on the fact that I was bringing up something that hadn't been brought up many times before that hadn't been worked on before. Uh, my petition the other night was driven by the fact that I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of seeing these students have no service that just, just got mentioned about ones that hot spots won't work for. I'm tired of expecting expecting the same result because we're not pushing the envelope. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of piecemeal efforts. Uh, the petition I brought forward had a $30 million price tag. That means two, two options. We either reallocate money from existing uh, capital projects, which is quite possible, or we bite the bullet and raise taxes. But this is not a simple thing. It absolutely is complicated by the state law that was put in place years ago. I'm willing to push the limit on that. I have really no idea how to, uh, no specifics on how to address this. And that's why I also ask that we put together a task force to look forward, to look toward how to do this. Uh, we either have to do this or we got to quit talking about it and just let some folks hang out there with no service. And I'm not willing to do that. Uh, so, you know, we'll go forward with this the best way we can. This is not a long, this is not a short term solution. The short term solution that I mentioned was getting hot spots. The long term solution is getting infrastructure in the ground. And just because you build the infrastructure does not mean you have to give it to the carriers. I, I look forward to being able to work with these carriers in some manner to get a uh, cooperative effort to uh, use county infrastructure and the carriers provide the service. One thing that got mentioned in the, uh, the chair's opening comments was that uh, I, I didn't catch the exact wording, but about data caps. And I'm not aware that, that the schools are being hit with data caps. Uh, throttling wasn't mentioned, but I've also heard uh, in other contexts throttling. So, would someone with the school system, either school system, speak to whether there are data caps on your service plans or if there is throttling being uh, put in place by the carriers? So the contract that we have with Verizon, it's for unlimited data and unthrottling. So there are no data caps and there is no okay. throttling? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, the, the next question I've got, you mentioned the remote centers, and I applaud you all for for, to, for going forward with these remote centers because that gets the kids out of the parking lots. I, uh, I work construction. I sit in a truck a lot during the day. Uh, I have bathroom facilities quite close by. I, I have air conditioning in my truck. I'm working in it. I knew what I'm – I took the job knowing what the situation was going to be. These kids went to school expecting to learn in a classroom. They're being forced to adapt 
they're forced to adopt uh, practices they never expected and the parents never expected. So I definitely commend you all for these remote learning centers. The question I've got is, have you all considered, I heard you all mention the kids going to uh, parking lots or areas near the schools. Have you all considered opening the school libraries as a learning center? Well, we opened, uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Commissioner McGee, for that question. Uh, we opened school cafeterias. So that's where um, the internet hubs are located. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I missed that some. No, that's okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, the, the next question I've got is uh, for both schools. Uh, on, I know you all have fund balances. I know you have fund balances that are allocated. I know you've got fund balances that are unallocated. My question will center around unallocated fund balances. Uh, are these fund balances because of the fact that the facilities are not in full use on the unallocated fund balances? Are they growing? Do you want to wait until we get to budget to talk about that? I so, can. We can get, I yeah, can. so we can give Chapel Hill a chance to, to do to okay. catch I up. I would drop that reports. right now. And then I've got one more question. And it goes to Commissioner Dorson's uh, comments on SROs. Uh, I, uh, I tend to agree with Commissioner Dorson that the uh, conversations should include both systems. Uh, but I guess my question is, is there an effort uh, in Orange County schools? Because I know Orange County schools have been quite supportive of SROs to defund the SRO program. So Commissioner McKee, I don't think that there um these tasks task forces are being created with any sort of goal in mind um the way that i understand that we are approaching the work is to really understand the living lived experience the value sros bring to orange county schools and the lived experience of our students and our faculty there so um i I don't think that we are approaching this saying that we are hoping to remove SROs necessarily. I think we're just trying to take this moment and assess the program, see if there are ways that we can um, improve it. And Sheriff Blackwood, we had a great conversation with him. He's totally in agreement with assessing how things are going, understanding how students feel about it, and taking the recommendations from there. To follow up, has there been any discussion of defunding? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, good. Because I just want to, you know, reiterate my position, which is a position of a lot of people in Northern Orange County and that have kids in the uh, county school systems. They are very, very supportive of SROs in these schools. Okay, let's go to James Edden next, please. Hi, everyone. Um, as you're setting up the and, and running these uh, with the YMCA, the partnerships, and also the, um, the the cafeterias, do you all have, are you, and you're using the three W's, do you have access to testing? Or how are you, how are you monitoring? Are you relying on, um, you know, if a, if a child is sick, you know, temperature taking or parent reporting or, um, just how is that working? I, I, just thinking as you try to, as we try to bring kids back, you know, what, what would that involve and what are we doing now? Um, good evening. Thanks for the question. Uh, with regards to the hubs um, and specifically the supervised learning labs, we do have attestation forms. We work closely and have worked closely with the Orange County Health Department um, since we had the idea to ensure they were on board. Um, and we are, um, as I mentioned previously, one of the reasons that, or one of the things we're learning is that we're preparing for plan B. And so we are following all of the Department of Instruction, um, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services guidelines, local guidelines, our internal guidelines, um, with regards to signs and posters throughout the building. But again, the attestation forms, um, students cannot um, get on a bus and cannot be dropped off and, unless they've completed that. And that, that includes if they've had any symptoms or been, um, uh, been around anyone that has, uh, has been um, identified with having COVID or COVID-like symptoms. Thank you. 
Thanks, James Etta. And uh, Bonnie Hauser? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a comment on the hotspots. And um, I know the county has been working on this for some time. And as an underserved rural citizen, I really appreciate the work. And we all know it's not going quite the way we expected it to. As a school district, the problem's now ours. So of the over 5,000 families in the county who don't have access to broadband, most of them are in the Orange County School District. And while we can't help everyone, the hotspot program has made a difference for over 1,000 families, which is extraordinary, way beyond my expectations, and I couldn't be prouder. Um, but with more tower infrastructure, we could reach more students. So I'll just, so I'm not the perfect solution, but within the current guidelines from the state and the, and the restrictions on Orange County providing service, we can't do that, but we can build infrastructure. So just wanted to comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's go to the Chapel Hill schools um, for their update of the COVID and, and if you can also uh, do one and two as the as the um, Orange County Schools did. That would be great. And I think Dr. Cosby, you're up first. Yes, thank you very much, Penny. You're welcome. It's, it's great to, great to be here and great to see everyone. Uh, it's a real honor to be back in Orange County for a little while. I had the great pleasure a few years ago of being here and getting to know many of you, and it's great to see your face once again. I hope all of you know how highly I regard both these school systems. Having worked with systems all across North Carolina, you have two of the best here and uh, very, very, very fine board, boards of education in both cases, and a wonderful progressive county. Uh, I, I brag all across North Carolina when I go uh, places about how great the cooperation is in Orange County and how strongly schools are supported here. So, so please know uh, from someone who sees lots of circumstances, you have much to be proud of. But to get to what I want to report to you, and I'll be much briefer because a lot of the explanations of different things were made in the previous presentation, and I can just give you a, a chapter of cardboard highlights of them. As far as uh, reopening, we are currently in a plan that carries us through first semester and the remote learning and virtual. Uh, however, the board did instruct me when they approved that, that I would periodically uh, see where we are to see what's changing and see if could be adjustments made and come back to the board with information on that. Uh, I, I was kind of surprised after the governor a week ago uh, said that K-5 schools could move to uh, in person. I knew that there'd be a lot of interest in that, and I thought we might have some pressures in Chapel Hill Carborough for it, but I've only actually had two emails that have asked for that. I had many, many, many that said, please don't do that. So uh, desires many times are localized, just like politics are and that they vary greatly across the state. So uh, I, our board will be uh, considering at their next meeting, October 1st, uh, making a discussion about what direction they may want to go if they want to make any adjustments. I have not heard any of them make any suggestions about that, but we're open to looking at that. Uh, we have metrics established along the CDC guidelines, similar to what Orange County has, and we're monitoring those consistently. And along with the advice from our uh, ABC Science Collaborative, we're making decisions from that. But as of right now, uh, I would not recommend a plan A, and I would uh, say that we would need some time to prepare for a plan B if our board should decide they want to begin to move that way. Our virtual program is, is very robust. It's been well developed, and I cannot uh, say better things about our staff and the job they're doing with it. Now, it's not perfect, and it'll never replace an in-person child and a teacher together. I mean, nothing gets better than that. But it's working well for us in most cases right now. Very well at the high school, well at the middle school, and fairly well for most elementary school students, except for our youngest ones. And of course, the attention span and the things that issues that that causes is a problem. Uh, we're also not offering everything we should offer for our special populations especially our uh, adaptive curriculum students. And I'll be bringing probably a recommendation at our October 15th board meeting of doing some special kinds of things uh, to open up and allow more activities for those students. That's a real priority for me to get something done for that, that group. Uh, and probably the group that we found that it's not working for as much as for other groups is our young families who have young children 
and they have two or three children and both parents have to work and they don't have any relatives in the area to provide childcare for them and there's difficulties in getting childcare and it's most difficult for those families. And those are the ones that I hear most from about wanting to go to a plan B. Uh, most of our other folks are say if and when you, things are safe to do that, fine, but please don't do it until then. But we will be looking at it in early October. The board will be discussing it and it's entirely up to my board which direction they go. I tell everyone I don't get to vote. I just get to make recommendations and then uh, uh, the board the board goes from there with it and I have seven wonderful, very caring, conscientious folks who will think through everything they do as they make very wise decisions. So that, that's where we are as far as how we're operating and reopening. We do have two uh, what we call scholastic learning centers uh, in cooperation with the YMCA and uh, two of those are located uh, in our school system and separate facilities from our schools. We've tried to keep most activities out of the schools and put them in other locations if we could. And uh, we have in the, those two centers, we have right at 100 students and they're, they're staffed. We have like one to 10 ratio of staff to students. They're socially distanced. Uh, their temperatures checked. All those things are done before they come in daily. If there is an issue and so far, we've had no no outbreaks whatsoever in those two centers. They operated very safely and we're delighted with that. Uh, we provide lunch and breakfast for them. We also send food home with them on Friday for the weekends. Uh, we provide transportation for them. So all those things are, are done in place and that's working really, really nicely for us. We have a third center that we'll be asking the board to approve at their October 1st meeting. And that's at the uh, University United Methodist Church. Uh, They've come forward and they can handle about 50 students. We've worked out the memorandum of understanding with that and that will be presented to our board uh, October the 1st. So those, those are working beautifully for us and we're really pleased with them. The students that are selected for that, our, our system is divided into different segments and the students come from segments where the average state test score is 2.5 or more. So we reach students who are more needy uh, we reach a lot of students who are English learners. So that's the mostly the composition of the, those two centers. And will be a similar kind of composition also that the church will be working with. So we're very, very, very pleased with that. Some other things that we're looking to try to do, uh, part of our issue with returning to in-person learning is the fact that uh, staff has serious concerns about safety. Uh, you, you hear that almost everywhere you go. And we're trying to do some things to, do, to educate, to let staff know that there are ways of doing things safely. If everyone does them, the three W's, uh, the proper spacing, all those plans in place and doing things correctly. Uh, the uh, Science Collaborative is doing webinars for us, helping make sure that our staff gets that information so they're educated and know what we're dealing with. And so we're looking also to try to open up a few other small, smaller programs that we may be able to also show success with and build confidence among our staff that we, we can do some things safely. And those are such things I'll be presenting to the board October 1st, a plan for going back to the on-road on road driving for driver's education. Uh, we have a couple of hundred students that have been through the uh, virtual class, but they have not been able to do driving on the road yet because you understand those conditions of closeness. And we have a plan developed that our science collaborative has reviewed for us and uh, Proven so they think we could carry out safely. We'll share that with the board. We're also ready to open up for athletics, a very specific kind of schedule following the High School Athletic Association guidelines, as well as a plan that I presented to the Science Collaborative and they, they've also approved that we'll be presented to the board on, on the first. And have been having, having meetings with our, what's called our SNAC committee, which is our special needs uh, parents who have children special needs programs met with them this week. We've got some exciting ideas on some, some things that we also going to bring October 15th to the board and getting especially our students and our adaptive curriculum back into some face-to-face -face learning and some, some of the therapy and services that they need. So we have those things moving. The scientific analysis board, uh, our science collaborative now, uh, Monique did a great job of telling you what the role of that is. We were very honored, along with Orange County, to start that group. It has spread. 
there are, I think, well, Nick mentioned before, I think there's actually 50 some systems in North Carolina now. If they're working with, receiving information, guidance, webinar training, just like we are. And that's, that's been a tremendous value to superintendents. Uh, I've had a number of superintendents across the state in meetings I've had recently say how, how beneficial that, that process has been to them. And Amy Fowler, our vice chair of my board, was very, very instrumental in getting that group started. And Amy, thank you for, for, for that. That's really paying great dividends to, to lots of folks. So, so that's happening. Food insecurity is a Chapel Hill Carborough jumped on that long before I showed up. So I cannot take any credit for it, but I brag about it everywhere I can. Uh, the, the community came together and through grants and donations raised right at a half a million dollars to fund, fund the program in Chapel Hill Carborough. Uh, to date, we have delivered approximately 600,000 meals to families and students. And by the end of December, we predict that will be at 800,000. So it's been extremely successful. It provides breakfast and lunch. It also provides food for weekends for the students, periodically provides boxes of produce and things for families. So it's just been a wonderful, wonderful example of what can be done. And I know Orange County schools have also been very, very successful. And folks across the state have just amazed me it's a long time superintendent to see systems come together like that all across North Carolina to, to help families that have nutritional needs. So that's, that's worked very well for us. As far as homelessness and school nurses, I'm going to ask Charlotte Banks, who is our uh, executive director for, senior executive director for student services. Charlotte, if you would give some information on those, please. Good evening, everyone. So starting with our students experience in homelessness in Chapel Hill, Carborough City Schools, we currently based on 2019-2020 data have 78 students um, who are experiencing homelessness, with the majority of them actually coming to us from the elementary level. And just to also provide some more context around that, of those 78 students, 74% of those students are African American with 10% being Caucasian and then less than 10% are represented by our Asian and our Latino students group. Right now during the COVID, we are actually working with our director of Title I programs and our social workers to frequently monitor these students as far as their academic performance, um, their attendance in remote learning, as well as identifying um, any types of supports and resources that they may need. And so those resources include, as Dr. Cosby referenced, um, access to food, as well as access to technology. And even in some cases, if there is a transportation need we are certainly um, making sure that we can provide that for those families. Um, one of the things, or actually two things that I'm proud to um, announce and we're thankful for, um, Dr. Cosby, in partnership with the Public School Foundation, made a call to our community about really being able to raise funds to support our families and students in need, and we're able to raise uh, up to $100,000. Those funds are also being used to support these families in securing housing, as well as other needs that they may have to make sure um, that our our students who are experiencing homelessness are also being safe while they're practicing um, remote learning. Uh, we also were able to be awarded by the state a McKinney-Vento subgrant. Um, this grant was awarded $15,000 per year for three years, and it was awarded for us to collaborate with Homestart to be able to provide academic support. Um, due to the closure of schools and the health pandemic, we were not able to follow through with our traditional plans, but we are currently looking at how we can explore options um, to set up academic programs for our students. Um, like Orange County, we also celebrate the fact that for every school, we have a school health nurse. So we have a total of 21 full-time nurses in Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. And our nurses have been in the forefront of helping us to ensure safety um, and, and to ensure that we're provide, um, following the health and safety protocols during this health pandemic. 
Um, as we have started to return back to school with remote learning, we are also having to keep track of things such as immunization and health assessments that students will definitely need to make sure are in place. Um, they are collaborating with our student services staff to support in social, emotional, and mental health needs for our students. And they're maintaining consistent contact with our students and families to ensure that even during this time of, of them not being in the building uh, with those students, that students also have access to being able to support their chronic health conditions. Um, during the time that we're running the programs um, at the Y centers, um, they are also doing checks for wellness um, to make sure that our, st our students also know that they still have access to those health services while they're at the camps. And they are collaborating with our Orange County Health Department um, to conduct community contact tracing, as well as providing ongoing professional development virtually um, for our schools, such as health promotion classes, um, practicing the PPE um, safety, as well as CPR and first aid. And Thank you, Charlotte. And I, and I got to talk and, and skip right over technology. So let me go back to that one before I talk about SROs. Uh, our Board of Education was very wise early on to see that we were go really going to have a need for technology. And they they went ahead and budgeted money and used CARES Act money and different different sources of funds and ordered very early as to, for the Chromebooks and the iPads that we needed for our students. So we were able to get all those in and, and, and delivered and distributed uh, prior either prior to school or the first couple of days of school. And uh, many, many systems across the state are still waiting for delivery of technology, if you did not know that. And for many of them right now, they're told, being told the earliest day possible to get it is probably 1st of December. And that, even that's not guaranteed. I noticed just recently that uh, at the, excuse me, Wake County Schools still is waiting on something like 18,000 pieces of equipment and uh, have that many students that do not have equipment yet. So so we're, we're in very good shape. Uh, we've... It, issued about 12,000 Chromebooks and iPads, uh, 1,400 hotspots for students, and an additional 170 hotspots for staff, including uh, substitute teachers. So we, we have a good supply and we have them out and, and they're working well. Uh, we do not have quite the connection issues that Orange County Schools has because we're denser and more, and, and, uh, more, more urban type setting and the connections are better, but we do, do we do have some spots that we have some difficulty. And uh, we've had a few spots that uh, our, our contract was, is with T-Mobile, it's for the hotspot and uh, also for 12 months of service with no, no, no data caps or no, no tethering. And so uh, that's working well, but we have in a couple of cases, we've gone back and had to add hotspots from some other companies, especially, uh, uh, AT&T, we have found that in some, some of the areas there is no uh, T-Mobile service, there's no Verizon service, but there is a at and service. So in those cases, we, we, we've installed AT&T hotspots and, and have some more order. Uh, uh, if this should extend into 2021, the next school year, uh, then we would probably have a need in Chapel of Carborough to repl do a lot of equipment replacement. Some of some of the equipment we you are using, some we already had, it's been updated, but there will be a need for some updating if this kind of circumstance continues, and we just don't know about that. Uh, we're also having issues. You know, we're servicing now about thirteen thousand devices with the same staff that we used previously just to service what we had in the schools. And in addition to that, we're now have become the tech people for all the parents in the school system who have questions or issues or, or those kind of things. And we're trying to provide the very best service we can. Sometimes we don't get it done as quick as we, we can. I had uh, good fortune that uh, when my board members, Dion, call our attention to one situation we had this week and we, we were on that and, and got it straightened out. Interesting situation. They had everything else working. Uh, they had their own, you know, our, the Chromebook wasn't working, and we thought it, the problem was the Chromebook. Well, when they got finally looked at it, it was, it was in a, an apartment complex, and there were so many different signals coming in 
there were like over a hundred different signals coming into that one apartment. And that was causing Chromebook not to be able to connect. So what we did, we put a hotspot in and that took care of the problem for them. So they've got their regular cable, but they've also got hotspot. So you just have to find those situations sometimes and work with them. But uh, so at some point in time, our board is going to have to look at uh, possibly upgrading our, our tech department. Uh, I've been working with them and looking at some, some possible options on that. Uh, we have a technical advisory council will be looking at that and we'll probably be bringing some suggestions to our board as to how we may reorganize a little bit better to serve, to serve our customers now that are in a very different situation than they were before this, this, this pandemic. And with that, I'll get to the, my last area before we come back later on the budget and equity. School resource officers, uh, we've had a lot of things expressed in our community about possibly uh, doing away with school resource officers. We've had a lot of uh, expressions the other way. So I, I've gotten emails extensively both ways. Uh, our board directed me to establish a task force. I'm in the process of doing that now, getting recommendations from different uh, community organizations and groups of folks that should be represented. Uh, three of our board members have agreed to serve. Uh, we're, we're open to other people who might, might feel a need. We're looking at special juvenile justice folks also being involved in it. And hopefully by the middle of October, that task force will begin meeting. Uh, the job will be to look at all any information they want to see, whether it's from expenditures, how they're being used. If we, we will probably do some surveys, especially our middle school and high school students to really get their feedback on what they've experienced. If they really see issues, if they do not see issues. So it, it's very, very wide open and with no, no effort to make it go any direction that task force will meet as many times as necessary, prepare a report and deliver that to our board of education who would then, then make, make a decision. Uh, Monique and I, we collaborate on a lot of things and, and we, we talk about and we share so that we're not just creating double kinds of things. Uh, and in response to Mark's question about doing things cooperatively, I think there's a need to always cooperate. However, you do have two different school systems and they are different. And uh, the makeup of uh, the feedback that would, would come to those two school systems might be very different. So I would advocate maintaining two separate task force, but sharing information in every way possible uh, to make sure that we're covering all the, all the bases that would need to be covered both ways. So with that, I'll, Madam Chair, I'll be happy to try and answer any questions. If someone Thank has. you, Dr. Cosby. Um, and uh, we, we'll get some hands raised. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, also express that during our school collaboration meeting and talking with both chairs, um, they were very open to um, having uh, some of whether a county commissioner wants to be a liaison or uh, step in and um you know there was there was a comment that it probably wouldn't be every meeting because with some of the meetings are going to be um with stakeholders that that um probably want to remain um not necessarily anonymous but not they they, they wouldn't necessarily come and speak if they felt that that um certain people were there so um but but there the invitation is open and i express that to um, my board as well uh, we yeah. haven't gotten the um, school collaboration minutes yet because we met so late that we didn't we, we haven't been able to catch up to that school collaboration minutes but, but and I, I would say if any of your board members have any organizations that they would make want to make sure is represented sure please please get me that information because i'm reaching out to any any in all that are recommended okay that's great good stuff okay um marianne please jump in Sure. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Dr. Cosby and Dr. Banks and all of our Chapel Hill Carborough cabinet who's here to share all this work and our board members as well. Um, we did just want to give a quick shout out and thank the Board of County Commissioners. Um, part of why we've been able to have the technology in the hands of our students is because you all quickly approved a capital lease. Um, back in May and that made it possible. And so I know sometimes when things seem urgent to us, um, you know, you might wonder why, and I just, I know we explained it, but we just wanted to express that appreciation because that did in fact make a really big difference for our students. So I just wanted to mention that, Penny, and um, and again, thank you all for that. Yeah, that's great. And then we, we actually came back for a special meeting to do the same for Orange County Schools. So 
um, we, we, you know, we, we, we um, they, they weren't quite ready in, in May. So we had a, you know, we had to catch up with to them. So we did, we did come back and do that over the summer in a special meeting. Um, so yeah. Okay. Questions, um, Earl. Yes, I uh, just want to express my appreciation for the Chapel Hill Carborough School being so proactive to address the uh, connectivity issue, the broadband issue with their students. I realize that you all don't have nearly as severe an issue with uh, the, the dead zones and the uh, lack of suitable reception. That's why you see me sitting at, uh, at Witted right now. Because if I was home, you might be able to hear me. You might not be able to hear me. I might be on and I might be off. So I, I, I know exactly what people are experiencing up here. And I, I knew there was that, that there was a better situation in Chapel Hill, better situation in the southern part of the county with Carver also. But uh, if if my my desire to get funding as a special item was not locked in on Orange County, although I knew they had a waiting list. Uh, that was considerably larger and growing than you all did. But if you all can identify needs specific to this, I would encourage you to speak with our manager to see how we can help with that also, not necessarily just hotspots. We'll, we'll certainly do that. Uh, in fact, your, your staff did contact us to see if if we still had a need. And, and we always take extra money if it comes our way, but we didn't want to just take it when we didn't need it. Right. You know, and, and I appreciate and, that also. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're exactly correct about the issue of, of broadband coverage all across North Carolina. You know, uh, I'm fortunate in Chapel Harbor with what we have, but I've also worked lots of other places. You know, I, I did an interim a couple of years ago in Madison County. I was there for about 15 months. You can imagine the connectivity issues in the mountain, you know, you get right in the towns and you go about half a mile outside of town. There's no, nothing else. So they, they have to, they run buses all over the county with hotspots, you know, for people. Kids, kids pull up to the McDonald's because McDonald's happen to have Wi-Fi. So uh, it's an issue everywhere and it does need to be addressed. And I'm delighted to hear this board of commissioners addressing it like you are. Thank you, sir. Additional questions for the Chapel Hill Carver Schools? I'm glad Monica went first. She laid it all out, I'll tell you. Yeah, you she got did. Down. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, thank you both for, for those updates. Um, this is just, geez, it's, a, it's just such a weird world we're living in. Um, you know, as uh, being on a, a committee since the uh, middle of February, um, making decisions for the county, it's just been so challenging, as you all know. Um, and that's why I said you make a decision today and it can change tomorrow because this is so fluid. Um, so uh, we, ag again, I just want to thank everyone. Um, I, I know you lose sleep over this just like we do, um, but y'all are doing a great job and, and, you know, we'll, we'll get these kids back on track somehow because um, we've got two great school systems, as Dr. Cosby said. Um, okay. Are we ready to move on to budget? And I guess, Dr. Cosby, why don't you do budget first um, with, uh, so we can give Dr. Felder a little break there. Um, and um, we'll, we'll move into your budget first. And this is about the CARES Act dollars that are going into spending and, yes. and then uh, 2016 bond project updates. Yes. We sent you an extensive document that has a lot of information, one section of which deals and gives information on all the different. But I'm going to ask our interim uh, chief financial officer, Jonathan Scott, if he would... Uh, just share information with you quickly about those those numbers and, and what we've done with the monies. Welcome, good Jonathan. Evening. Yeah, good evening, everybody. It's nice to be back in front of you. Um, good to see everybody again. Um, so as Dr. Cosby alluded to, we did provide some pretty detailed information on all the funding sources in your attachment. So I'm gonna try and go through it relatively quickly in the interest of time and um, just kind of explain some of the funding sources and what we're looking at in total funding. Um, it's important to know that the funding kind of comes in two buckets. Some of it comes within the federal grant fund and some of it comes within the state public school fund. The CARES Act, uh, the primary CARES Act fund comes in the federal grant fund. Um, and that is uh, 
basically what everybody refers to as the CARES Act. But in federal funding, we are slated to receive just under $1.3 million, uh, 865000 of that uh, is the traditional CARES Act funding. Um, we're going to use that for technology equipment, uh, mostly to support uh, virtual instruction. Uh, we're going to use it for operating PPE supplies and equipment for crisis response. Uh, there's additional funding coming into the federal grant fund for uh, specialized instructional support um, to provide physical and mental health support services for students. Uh, we're talking about using that to target uh, school psychologists and social emotional support for the kids. Um, and then we have some additional money, 112,000 that uh, is really targeted for uh, at risk kids um, once they get back into the school instructional environment. So most of that money will probably target towards tutoring. So we've got about 1.3 million coming in federal money. Um, and then we have roughly 1.2 million coming in the state public school fund in a variety of different uh, variety of different programs. Uh, one of the one of them to note is uh, the state provided 331,000 for uh, what they call Project Jumpstart. Um, and it was basically elementary remediation that we used during the summer to provide uh, K-5 remediation summer programs for reading and math. And we were able to reach uh, just around 500 children and summer programs and utilize that money completely. Um, so again, there's a bunch of different um, PRCs within the state. It's all included in your packet. Um, and it's roughly 1.2 million. I'm sorry. Yeah, 1.2 million. So in total emergency funding, we're right at 2.5 million. Um, to date, with the Federal CARES Act money, we have spent and encumbered $610,000 uh, primarily on Wi-Fi's school technology, as I mentioned, PPE supplies and equipment, uh, all primarily directed at COVID-19 response. I uh, spoke earlier, we spent just under 350,000 of the 121 money for Project Jumpstart for remediation. Um, we have encumbered State 124, which is uh, student computers and devices. That money we've completely encumbered for uh, additional Chromebooks and wireless internet um, and then we also received 120, our PRC 125, we received just shy of two, 400,000 to support uh, child nutrition efforts. Uh, for the year ended 630, 2020, we spent half of that um, to support meal delivery and meal preparation and child nutrition. And that's a, kind of a brief overview of the emergency money that we received to date and as I alluded to earlier, we spent spent or encumbered roughly half of it, and the rest of it we're targeting towards uh, needs as they arise. Thank you, Jonathan. Dr. Foster, you want to continue with the 2016 update? Bob? Yes, yes, uh, on bond projects, uh, Patrick Cosby. Dr. Cosby, one second. I think James oh, sure. and I have a question. Okay. Um, and this is really for both uh, districts. Have You've been able to um, keep everyone employed, or did you have to do any layoffs and um, or, or attrition problems? And then with, that's one question. The second question is, was the Project Jumpstart uh, virtual or in person, or what did that look like? We, did, we have not laid anyone off. We kept Good. everyone employed. Uh, uh, we've we've got some of them di in different assignments. You know, mm -hmm. some of those jobs have not been needed, so they're doing all kinds of other things uh, that have not been needed. On Project Jumpstart, Jessica, are you available? Can you comment on that, Jessica O'Donovan, our instructional person? Yeah, there she is. Hi, Jessica. Good evening, everyone. Our Project Jumpstart, our Summer Jumpstart program was entirely virtual. Um, in July, we just did not feel it was safe to bring children in to the buildings for in-person instruction. So we served all of our students in very, very small groups, groups of five or less, and in some cases we did individual support. Thank you. Thank Dr. Felder, did you all have to um, lay anybody off? We, no, uh, hold on one second, there we go. I'm sorry, clicking so many buttons here. Uh, no, not at the moment, we have not. Thank you. Very fortunately that we have not had to do that. Good. 
Okay, Dr. Cosby, you want to finish up with the 2016 bond projects, and then we can go to Orange County uh, CARES yeah. and bonds. Yes. Uh, Patrick Obley, our assistant superintendent, would you uh, report on that, please, sir? Thank you. There he is. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, let me say thank you to the commissioners and to the Board of Education for supporting and having a bond. Uh, many um, individuals in my position around the state uh, do not have updates to give because they don't have bonds and bond projects. So we do appreciate the support both of the commissioners and the community to have the bond funds. We received uh, $72,108,000 uh, for our bond projects. There were two projects listed as primary projects for the bond funds. One was the Chapel Hill High School renovation project, and the second was the Lincoln Center um, upgrade and renovation project, which also included um, some upgraded facilities for the maintenance department in coordinating consolidating pre-K programs within a single campus as well. That project, the Lincoln Center project, was put on hold once bids were opened. Um, there was project overages and it was just no way under the bond funds to do both projects. So the primary project has been the Chapel Hill High School project. You see in the bond listing for funds expended, there were some initial design work and some other um, work that was done preparing the, the documents for bidding um, to get the assessments done of the Lincoln Center project. So that's why you see that small amount that was expended for Lincoln Center. When we look at the total cost of the Chapley Hall High School project, we're showing um, the project cost at just over $75 million. The difference in that three uh, point uh, million dollars there in November of 2018, the Board of Education um, approved the fund balance appropriation for some contingency money for the project, as well as an additional renovation um, to, a, to build a new uh, career technical education building to house the firefighting program, public safety program at Chapel Hill High School. And so that was um, about $2.3 million for that project. Of the cost expended to date, we're about 80% uh, of the cost expended. We're expecting substantial completion in January, uh, around the 15th of the month. We did give you one of the links within the information um, some high quality pictures to show you the construction site and, and how things have been moving and progressing. I think you'll be very pleased uh, with the renovations that have taken place. Although we've had a couple new buildings on the campus, a new main building, um, there's also a classroom addition that was um, renovated and built on the campus and then that new CTE building I talked about. There's also been additional renovations um, to what we're calling the existing B building that contains um, the athletic programs, the large gym, small gym, cafeteria, kitchen, there's been inside renovations that are still going on in that area. And then Haynes Auditorium received some substantial um, upgrades as well. And so we're working on that. It does not mean the entire campus has been upgraded. There's still um, system components and things in the building that are many years old um, that are on maintenance or um, capital project scheduling for the future. Uh, but we were able to touch many areas of, of the campus as well with uh, not only the upgrades that were planned, but some redesign as well. We did find some things, certainly when you're doing a project of a school of that age, you're going to find some unknown conditions and things. But overall, um, we are progressing to ensure that um, we have the building open and ready for the second semester. Uh, we will try to schedule a walkthrough for the commissioners and our Board of Education just as soon as possible. We are hoping um, to have the main, the new main building opened um, later uh, once we get an occupancy permit later this month. And so we certainly would invite you to come see um, that building uh, when it when it opens. So um, that's a just a quick update um, on the project. Again, um, you know, we do appreciate your support and I know there's additional information if you have any questions about that project. Uh, Patrick, would you also update on the Phillips Middle Project? Yes, thank you. So I know we have questions in reference to capital projects, some other projects. We have about 31 other capital projects that are ongoing right now with the capital funding that is provided um, by the county. Folks don't realize, but the majority of all of our capital dollars comes locally from 
the county commissioners. So you support um, almost entirely all the capital projects that are that are taking place within the school districts. There is some money that does come from the lottery proceeds. So we do we do have many projects ongoing. I wanted to give you an update on the Phillips Middle School. We we did address um, through the capital. Um, investment plan, a drainage project and the need at the school. There was uh, water infiltrating from the courtyard area down to a second level in one of the classroom buildings. Uh, we were able to do the assessment last year, this summer, the majority of the work done on that campus was to improve that condition. Um, you can see some before and after pictures where, where some pretty extensive sidewalks and areas that needed to be dug up to um, replace pipes that have been in the ground 40 plus years. And so that work is done. Um, I walked the site um, last week and we we look great. There has been no additional issues with drainage or water coming into the building since that um, project was completed. And, and also with that, there was um, a phasing project that was being done as well. And that was to take out some of the old asbestos uh, floor tiles and abate um, the building and, and to replace. And we were in phase three of that work. And so I wanted to share some pictures of that. There's other large projects still going on the Phillips campus. One, a couple of those are HVAC projects um, for the gymnasium and auditorium. And those are in the bid phase right now. So um, those large projects will be completed um, in the near future as well. We've got lighting project going on there. So again, for a campus that has had some upgrades over the years, there's a lot of needs and we are getting those um, projects completed. We're trying to take as much advantage right now of students being out of the building. So if there's any, um, you know, positive takeaways, I hate to say it that way because so many families are suffering and there's so many, so much loss of life, but if there's anything we can do to improve the condition, it certainly has been to try to get some of these maintenance projects completed because the window in the summertime is just so short um, that we've been able to continue getting getting work done in the schools. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. I have a question, uh, hand up for Mark Markopoulos. Yes, uh, thanks, Patrick, for that uh, report on the Phillips Middle School. When did the repairs begin on on that issue? Temporary repairs were put in um, either late fall or early winter last year. Once the assessment was completed and they found where the water was coming through, it was backing up from the drains and I don't know exactly the underground metrics where the connections were failing, um, but there were temporary drains put over the concrete, over the sidewalks and from the canopy areas um, through the spring of last year and then the actual digging um, and pulling up of the sidewalks and all that was done this summer. As you can see, that's a major walkway between the buildings and we weren't able to do that work until students left campus. But the majority of that work was done this summer. So the work didn't require any work within the classrooms though, right? It was all out in the courtyard? Out in the courtyard. There was some hallway work, some repair work we had to do. Um, uh, on the lower level, we, we had lockers that were replaced. We had those floors that were already scheduled to be replaced. There's still some inside work in the lower level to be completed. We have some wall damage um, that we're still working on and getting completed. They'll be repainting, resurfacing. Um, but yes, sir, the majority of that was outside um, that needed to be done. So do you think that if the work had begun in July of last year when the money was appropriated by the county and everything was, uh, you know, in line. For, and if that work had done then, would it have saved potential work later? Any damage to the lockers might have been saved or what, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, certainly, um, you know, any anytime water's coming in a building, doesn't matter when it is, it's never a good situation. Uh, one of the things I've talked to county staff about before is how we do the funding and the funding cycles. With us not knowing or receiving the county money until July 1 for new capital funding that's released, we can't hire engineers, we can't get bids in, we can't do projects and renovations when the money's approved or the money 
um, is appropriated on July 1 to get projects completed in the summer. So we start out um, in the first assessment for the money appropriated was to get the assessment completed. And so as soon as that assessment was done and identified the issue, that's when the, the temporary drains were put in place. Now I can't answer how many years um, that had gone on or if that could have been remediated sooner to your question, you know, as far as any additional damages that were done from that. But I do think um, as soon as the project was identified, the project money was appropriated, um, the process began as quick as it could. So, uh, you know, considering the desperate situation that it, that it was described as, it's hard for me to believe that with, uh, you know, a, a healthy fund balance that y'all have that you couldn't have gone on ahead and started that work early to save future damage knowing full well that the county would back you in the later repairs. So I'm, I'm just stumped by, by the whole, um, you know, the practicality of the issue with the schools. And, and then of course it, it blossomed into a, you know, a whole nother, a whole nother issue in the community. But I, I don't understand why you had to wait until you went back to the county to describe the situation and ask for a draw, so to speak, when I know that's not how the county operates when they uh, work with y'all. Yeah, I can't answer that question. I certainly happen to defer because I'm not sure what part of the question was for me, but coming into Chapel Hill in 2019, the, um, the project was identified, the project was assessed, the project remediation was started. And so, you know, I feel like from the time I've known about the project, there has been an ongoing process to get the project addressed. Yeah, well, so I think I think the whole thing points to um, a real need for uh, transparency on the part of uh, the schools and the county and everyone involved in this. And it seems to me that, you know, we're talking about a committee for school resource officers, which is uh, you know, really a great idea. It seems to me with, with all the confusion around this stuff and the, uh, you know, the obvious um, ability uh, for people to exploit these kind of things that we ought to have a joint committee of both representatives from both school boards and county commissioners and some staff to stay on top of these um, maintenance and repair issues so that the public understands what's going on so that the school boards and the commissioners know what's going on. Because I know uh, that there has been behind the scenes amongst the staff, you know, re real, uh, you know, serious and practical collaboration to take care of these issues. And I, I think having such a committee would help everyone understand the reality of the situation and actually help solve these issues sooner and uh, probably at less cost. So I would propose that we set up some sort of a committee like that because it, it's a serious issue. I mean, with the, the state legislature, you know, the war on education and the way they deny funds to us, um, we're in a difficult situation and um, we need to, you know, rather than set the vices to the community around the issue of political gain, we need to pull together and figure out how to collaborate and how to help the public understand what is being done. Hey, thanks, Mark. We have a question from Earl. Earl, you have to unmute. Can never remember to turn it on, can never remember to turn it off. All right. Uh, so uh, would this be a appropriate time to bring up my question about unallocated fund balance? Uh, uh, sure. I think you can ask that to each school system. So Okay. Yeah, that would be for both school systems. Uh, and I don't need exact figures. It's my understanding that the unallocated, I'm not interested in the allocated fund balance. I'm interested in the unallocated fund balance. It's my understanding that the unallocated fund balance has been growing from the point that schools were, or from the point of going to virtual learning, uh, effectively closing the building facilities and today. So could each system speak to where they stand on that? I don't need specific figures, just 
Yeah. Just generally. Yeah. I'll ask Jonathan to give you some, some more specificity, but that's been happening, uh, Earl, I think, all across the state. I'm hearing that everywhere. Uh, because, of, because, that, of, yes. because of savings from not utilities and operational expenses, plus the CARES Act, I think that's happening. But, Jonathan, could you speak to our particular situation? Most certainly. Uh, and you are correct. Um, when we started spooling down in March, um, we made a very concerted effort to try and curb our spending in the event of the unknown coming, right? Um, so a lot of purchasing and uh, non-essential uh, non-essential spending was spooled down almost immediately just because of the unknown. So our audit is not complete yet, so I don't have any kind of final numbers to present to you. Um, but I anticipate at the end, at June 30th, 2019, we're at roughly 11% undesignated, unreserved. Um, I am anticipating projecting that'll go to about 12.5%. Um, it would be more than that, but remember we had to... Uh, the board had to appropriate quite a bit of fund balance uh, in this year's budget. Um, I think we had like 2.3 million we had to appropriate for state mandated raises and health insurance increases. Um, then the board appropriated a million dollars for COVID response and an additional amount for project advance. So the unallocated unreserved number is held, um, held down because of the fund balance appropriation. But yes, at the end of the day, last year, our revenues will exceed our expenditures. I just don't have a, a final number for you. Our audit starts in a week, so be I don't. I don't need. I don't even want specific numbers. That's not why I'm asking. Yes, sir. Okay, let's go to the um, Orange County uh, Schools yes, uh, Cares uh, Act. Uh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, Rhonda Rapp, our Chief uh, Financial Officer, can speak to that. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's good to uh, see you again and good to be here to take an opportunity to share with you um, some of the things that are happening in Orange County Schools. Uh, Jonathan did an awesome job of explaining a lot of the detail about the funds and where they're coming from. I'm also going to talk um, from the slides that were um, given to you ahead of time. And basically, in Orange County Schools, we have received roughly um, $2.1 million in uh, COVID-19 relief funds. One thing um, that I do want to point out is that 42% of those for us expire on December the 30th. Um, there's a small, only the federal funds and the funds coming to us through federal sources are actually um, extended beyond December the 30th of this fiscal year. It's also, you know, Jonathan talked about, and as you can see in our details, they're pretty specific in regards to how they can be expended as well. There's very little flexibility in those funds that are flowing to us from our state resources. There's a little bit more um, flexibility in those federal funds, but um, those that are flowing to us through our state resources are, are fairly restricted. Um, of the $2.1 million to date, we have roughly spent and encumbered um, almost roughly 46% of those funds. And, um, of course, those details are included for you in your packet. Ms. Uh, Commissioner McKee, to address your question in regards to an assigned fund balance, um, our audit has is in the processes of being finalized. We also uh, did have a savings this past school year as things began to wind down in March. We, too, also began uh, curbing expenditures for not knowing what was ahead and what would be needed going forward. Uh, it is looking like that we will increase uh, our fund balance roughly one point. $3 million to bring our unassigned fund balance to um, approximately $3.7 million. Okay, thank you very much. That was sort of the, the ballpark I was in. And before anybody thinks, I'm going to start talking about cutting funding to the schools <laughs> because you all have a growing fund balance. That's not where I'm going. Uh, so the next question tied to that. I've I've heard it. I've heard a little bit of mention tonight, and I've heard a lot of conversation uh, here, there, and and with parents and just general conversation about the possible effect 
a virtual learn, virtual learning on the emotional and social welfare of these children, especially those with special needs. If uh, if you all would just speak to that a little bit, and and so that I don't have to come back on, I would encourage you uh, to use some of this unallocated fund balance to address any problems you all see with these children, because I'm more concerned with the children. Uh, I think one of the superintendents mentioned uh, that this seems to be having a greater effect on those young families with little children and both parents having to work. I also know that this is highly impacting families that have both parents or a single parent has to work, put food on the table and cannot afford the tutors, cannot afford a lot of the other uh, availability, uh, other available options. Uh, so before you, just so that I don't have to come back on, I would encourage you all to do whatever is necessary to keep these at-risk kids up to speed because just from my personal opinion is if we were to do it, do an assessment of grade level growth. I'm not sure we're going after a year of this. I'm not sure we're going to see a lot. So I'll stop now and, and just listen to what you all have to say. Well, you're you're preaching what I believe, and that's that's nice to hear. Uh, there's no question that children are going to be behind. I would I would anticipate they're at least a half a year behind, maybe a year behind by the time the next testing is done, and because they they just miss so much. So. Systems are going to have to design ways. Now, you can't just overload them right now, you know, because they've got a lot going on. But certainly expanded summer programs and offerings and those kind of things, I think, are going to really be a need. Now, I won't be around to do any of that, but I'm sure both these systems will address that. But that's you're, you're exactly on target, Earl, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I, I also agree that, um, you know, you're spot on with that. Um, Indeed, uh, this uh, situation is certainly um, uh, presenting pretty, uh, plenty of challenges for uh, some of our families, some more than others, of course. Um, but there are students who um, were at risk before the pandemic and are certainly uh, at risk now. And um, uh, we are certainly looking at um, ways and strategies to uh, address uh, their needs now. Uh, we had a successful summer uh, program. We did see gains uh, for the students who participated, and that was great. Um, but we're also looking at how we can, uh, uh, what more we can do during the school year to uh, support students. So uh, we have imp are imp implementing a, um, uh, a on Friday mornings for some of our students an opportunity to get a, a additional support. Um, but we're also uh, considering other ways to do that. And so that could come through um, before and after school uh, tutoring on the weekends. Um, but I, I do think that um, for some of our students, it's just going to come down to when it's safe to do so, um, getting them back to in-person instruction. I, I said I wasn't going to come back on, but I want to tell both of you, thank you. Uh, you all reflect my greatest fear. Uh, and it's not that it's not that I had the wealth to do it, but when my children were in school, if they needed tutors, I hired tutors. And I done without on other things. Commissioner Markopoulos uh, a few minutes ago mentioned on the Phillips School issue, uh, the county's a backstop. Uh, that's why I, I mentioned the county picking up these hotspots. So please do not sit on unallocated funds and let this issue go. Uh, we're going to lose kids, basically, and I mean we're going to lose some of these children completely if we don't address this in every math that we can. Okay, thank you. And I, and I think that's one of the reasons uh, I, I'm thanking the school systems. I think they're doing a really, really good job of trying to make sure that they don't leave anyone behind. And it's a difficult situation. So I, we all appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, let's, do, we, do we have an update on the 2016 bond um, from um, Orange County as well? Yes, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I was going to turn that over to our uh, Chief Operations Officer, Dr. Danny Williams, to provide that update. Great. Welcome, Danny. Yes. Good evening, Madam Chairs and, and Madam Vice Chairs of both boards, or all three boards, actually, and to all of the uh, board members, to our respective superintendents and staff that are, uh, that are involved here tonight. So I'll begin by sharing with you that our uh, bond updates uh, includes having a total office renovation for uh, Eflin Cheeks, one of our elementary schools. And that is to be completed uh, this month, actually. Um, long time coming, but is completed uh, very much. And um, staff is beginning to move into that particular location. We have secured um, at seven locations uh, a security uh, vessels for all of the schools. So that is a safety issue. People can't just walk into the front of the offices of every school. Uh, so the vestibules are uh, created. So it's a one way in and a different way out uh, to also help us with the COVID-19 safety concerns. And that's at seven of our um, locations. The others would not have needed it because they already had uh, such that would be safe uh, to their locations. Um, we have um, roof and asbestos removal from two of our schools that will be Grady Brown and Central Elementary. Uh, that is ongoing to be completed next month in both of those respective schools. Um, we have a Sunnitrol security system, uh, which allows us to be able to um, install the security and camera systems for all schools. We began with the high schools and next will be the middle and then elementary and then any other remaining facilities of Orange County Schools. This will include monitoring and card reader access at all locations. Programming and system setup will follow installation as buildings come online. This will be an additional layer of safety for all of our facilities. We also, with the said associates, uh, we are having some uh, mechanical re um, renovations and design for two of our schools. That will be Cameron Park and Orange, uh, and Orange County uh, High School will be dealing with the, the, the HVAC geothermal process. And that will end December of 2021 with that particular major pro project uh, using bond funds. Um, so therefore, um, you have kind of the, the, the down and dirty of the um, bond projects going on and the timeline in which they shall end. Uh, there are other summer projects going on as well, uh, multiple ones of them, and they all are moving very well. Uh, we look forward to those projects ending uh, by December, such as another bond project that I failed to mention is the Cedar Ridge High School um, classroom addition project. That is to be um, hopefully turnkey operation December of this year. We would like to, as Patrick indicated of Chapel Hill, we would like to invite um, our board members and county commissioners for a grand touring of this facility, beautiful facility, once it is completed in December. Um, I think we all will be proud of the bond dollars that have gone forth to do the projects that we are doing in Orange County Schools. And I'll entertain any questions at this time. Thank you, sir. Questions for the Orange County Schools about budget. Oh, you all got off easy, I don't know. Okay, yeah, we go. James Etta has a question. There you go. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I just missed Dr. Williams. I couldn't hear what you said at the very beginning about Eflin Cheeks Elementary. What oh, what yes. what good thing happened? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we did a complete office renovation. The old office is in a different location from where the new office is now. Beautiful front office for the school, um, and that is almost in completion. It should be done by the end of this month. Thank you. Okay. My pleasure. 
All right. Thanks, James. Etta. All right. Oops, sorry. We're going to move on to the um, uh, number four in equity. I know um, I know both schools have uh, started uh, or have been engaged in their equity projects. So I, I don't know who wants to talk about that first. Uh, maybe Dr. Felder, since uh, we let uh, Mr. Mr. Cosby go first last time, uh, if that's okay with you. <laughs> fine by me, and I'm sure it's fine by him as well. Uh, yes, and so uh, in just a second, I'll turn things over to Dr. D Dina Keeling. She's our chief equity officer. Uh, just cannot overemphasize um, how important um, equity is in uh, Orange County schools, and we are grateful for all of the support uh, from our Board of Ed and um, um, our school board and uh, from county commissioners with regards to the equity work that we're doing in, in the district. I've been a number of places too, and um, I'm just extremely impressed and proud of the work that we're doing uh, with regards to equity. It is truly the um, foundation of everything we do, every decision um, it's the thread that runs through our work. And um, as I said, I've been in other places and um, I, I've, I've not seen the work move as quickly as it's moving here and having uh, the impact that it's having. Yes, there's a lot to be done. So don't get me wrong. We've got a long way to go, but I'm just very impressed. So with that, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> very passionate about equity uh, and turn things over to uh, Dr. Uh, Dina Keeling, who's also uh, passionate about equity. Dr. Keeling. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I had to get to my notes. I had lost my internet connection, much like we talked about all night, right? So. These hotspots went out on you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so as Dr. Felder said, equity is one of our district priorities, um, in addition to literacy and family engagement and culture and climate. Um, everything we do, we do through an equity lens. Um, and it's my, my job and my role to, to make sure that that's what we're doing and to keep equity always on the table. Um, I do want to thank you all. Before I was hired last year in July, um, you all as a board of county commissioners approved some joint funding for um, Orange County Schools and Chapel Hill Carborough Schools. And, and so we have been using that funding. We've been working together to come up with um, professional development plans for each year. Um, so last year uh, we did a contract with Pacific Education Group. And through that contract, we have done equity training for all of our uh, district leadership, uh, as well as all of our school counselors, our uh, college and career advisors, our math and literacy coaches, and uh, two to three teachers from every school. And uh, we did two two-day trainings of Beyond Diversity for those groups. Um, and the, the staff members that did the, the trainings, the school-based staff have gone on to be our school-based equity teams. So now every one of our schools has a school-based equity team. Um, they've all been trained in uh, the Beyond Diversity work um, as a cabinet and uh, as well as our school principals have gone through monthly trainings with Pacific Education Group. Um, teaching us how to lead a district through equity, teaching us how to lead schools with equity in mind, how to understand our data, how we disaggregate our data, how we keep our centered students centered, which I will give more information about in a second. Um, and so um, in addition to continuing that work with Pacific Education Group, which because of COVID kind of came to a screeching halt, they had to revamp how they were doing their trainings because everything is so personal and in person with them. Um, but they have moved to an online platform. So we are continuing with our, sorry about that, continuing with our um, district level training um, with them. And we will continue with our training for our principals as well. Um, we also began working with um, an organization called IDRA, which is the 
Intercultural Development Research Association. Um, they work with different school systems across the South. They actually do uh, free trainings for us. And so um, they work through a grant, I believe that it is through the Department of Education. And so they are um, coming in, looking at different data that I asked for them to help me to analyze. And then they put together like an entire plan for us. Um, so we have four trainings that we will be doing with them. We just did our first round last week. That was kind of an introduction to identity. Who am I and who are my different identities and what different identities do my students bring to the classroom um, and having an appreciation for it for that um, and beginning to talk about implicit bias and dispelling some of the stereotypes around different identities and reclaiming um, our identities and seeing them as as powerful parts and components of ourselves and um, having them to do that with their students as well um, they will also be doing training with us on authentic family engagement and communicating with families of all different diverse backgrounds. And we will, um, they will do another session with us on introducing an introduction to culturally relevant practices. So beginning to move in that direction for, um, it probably will take us next year before we can really do culturally relevant instruction because we're really laying this groundwork with staff this year, um, which kind of leads me into our school-based equity teams. Um, as I said, every school now has an equity team. Every equity team has a lead. Um, I had my first meeting with them last night. Uh, they were um, asked to bring what were the goals that each school has set around equity. Um, and just in our conversations and talking, what they realized was that Wow, even when we set our equity goal, like that's not really the essence of what equity is. And so um, we really talked a lot about going slow to go fast and really helping staff to understand why this work is important, how it ties into outcomes, student outcomes, um, reflecting, having staff do a lot of self-reflection about, again, like their identities and, and where they are in this process. Um, and building a vocabulary around equity, just helping people to understand the definition of different equity terms and um, what they mean, what they mean to them, so that we all just have a common language in the district. Um, we have our equity task force, which has community members on it, as well as staff members. Uh, we are in the process of um, having an application process to go out. Again, I was just about to do that when COVID hit. In fact, my deadline for the application was gonna be March the 31st and then COVID hit. So um, I am going to pick that back up and um, get more community members involved, get a diverse group of stakeholders. There will be teachers on the task force. There will be students on the task force. There will be um, parents and guardians as well as community members. So anyone who works in a community organization that works with Orange County Schools, then you're open to applying and coming on board and helping us on our task force. Our task force is tasked with making recommendations to the superintendent and to the board of ed, our Orange County School Board, um, about issues that relate to equity. Um, and so they'll be looking at different data, again, like the different uh, goals that the, the schools will have. They will look at that. Um, policies that we have will come through the equity task force for them to kind of review and make sure that our policies are equity oriented. Um, so that's some of the work of our task force. Um, I recently started affinity groups and I did that because there were a number of things that were going on um, across the nation that were really affecting, particularly our African-American staff members. Um, in fact, someone had written an article or probably more than one that was like, you know, check in with your African-American and black employees and staff members, they're not okay. And so um, I felt like we needed to give them some support. And so we, uh, 
started to do an affinity group and it was very well received by the staff members. They, in fact, were like, it was the first time that they really felt like Orange County schools wrapped their arms around them and like made support specifically about stuff that they were going with and, and dealing with. So we will continue to have those. We will expand those beyond African American to other groups and other identities as well. Um, I don't want to forget to mention our student equity teams. Uh, we have an equity team at Orange High School of students that is a powerful organization. Um, I will be honest, like they direct a lot of my work. I ask them, what are you seeing? What do you need to see happen? And then that's what I go back and try to make happen. So one of the things they told me last year was that they wanted an African-American history course. They want a, um, an, a Latinx history course. And so we were able to go ahead and put an African-American history course at Orange High for the spring. We are working on the Latinx history course. And I just met with them um, yesterday and they also want an indigenous people's studies course. And so we will work on all of those to make those happen for them. They wanna see more representation of staff of diverse backgrounds. They wanna see representation of staff that look like them in the classes. They wanna see diversity in their advanced courses. Um, they wanna feel welcome when they are in schools and they want people to be held accountable when people commit a harm um, of, of intolerance, of racial intolerance or any kind of intolerance. So um, that becomes the work, right? So I go back to the school-based equity teams and say, this is these are the focus for this year. We have got to make this a safe and inclusive environment for our students. Um, even in the midst of COVID that's going on, like they still are feeling it, even in their remote settings, they still wanna feel, um, like they are welcome and included and not to have slurs or any other terms or microaggressions thrown at them. And so um, that's what we're working on. We are in the process right now of looking at a gender support policy to put some guidelines in place for um, gender. And we have the equity teams as well as our student equity teams and some of our other student groups who are looking through that those guidelines, um, you know, like I told my, my equity leads, nothing about us without us. I can't speak because I am heterosexual. So I'm not gonna be the only one to lay eyes on this policy. I'm gonna make sure that um, other people are looking at it, particularly those who the guidelines would affect so that they can give us direction with that. Um, just a couple more things. Um, we have our, what we call our centered students. So these are our students who have historically been pushed to the margins in Orange County schools. Uh, we, we look at our data across a seven year trend. We have a um, certain student groups who we have not been educating the way that we should be educating. And that's not a hit to our teachers that is a culture that we just have to shift and we have to make sure that their needs are being met, that their experiences are censored, that their voices are censored. And so those are our African-American students, our Latinx students, our economically disadvantaged students, our um, English language learners, or we call them emergent bilingual students, um, our McKinney-Vento homeless students, our students with disabilities and our ESSA students in foster care. And so whenever we're making plans and we're thinking about plan B right now, um, it's important that we make sure that those students are centered, that we don't make a plan and then try to make adjustments for those students, that really we make the plan with them in mind. And then what I'm trying to help everyone to understand is if you make a plan with our center students in mind, you'll find that it's a plan that tends to work for everyone else. But when you do it the other way, then you, you're trying to make a plan fit for them that you never intended to work for them to begin with. So that's um, some of the work that we are doing um, in terms of like some of the challenges, just um, I am a, a department of one. I don't even know if you call it a department or you just call it me, but um, so it, it is, um 
a big lift to, to make sure that the district in every department and in every school is um, keeping equity at the forefront and, and really building this because we've never had this before in Orange County schools. Um, but it, it is helpful to have the equity teams and to have um, the different training for different people at the district level so that I can kind of make sure that it's happening in, in a number of places and that it's not just on me to make that happen. Um, another challenge I would say is, is the um, racial climate that we're experiencing right now. We have um, the students who are really talking about some of the things that are being said and that are happening to them. And, um, and that's, that's just hard to hear um, because you, you definitely don't want students to feel harm and you definitely don't want them to feel like they're not safe. Um, and so, and I mentioned it before that it would just be helpful if we had like a community wide focus on um, creating a safe and inclusive environment um, because I can do the work in the schools, but um, if there are things that are being said in the community, then that's kind of beyond everything that I can like wrap my arms around. So um, I think that is everything. I don't know if Dr. Felder had something that I missed, but pretty much that's what equity is looking like in Orange County schools. Dr. Keeling, you didn't miss a thing. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Thank you so much. It was very comprehensive uh, and, and lots of good work. It sounds like lots of good work is going on. We have a question from um, Sally Green, Commissioner Green. Hi, Dr. Kim. Thank, thank you. Um, I was really interested in what you said about the students actually wanting courses in African-American history, et cetera. Um, and maybe you're aware of this, but I just want to make sure you were aware of the ready-made DPI approved curricula that are found at the Carolina, Carolina Public Humanities Program. They are specifically uh, in all kinds of civil rights topics, African-American history, Jim Crow, Reconstruction, slavery, and they're, they're made for either eighth grade social sciences, American History One, American History Two, or civics and economics. Uh, it's a great resource. Are you aware of that? So, you know, I'm not a teacher, so I, I, I know that um, we have our, a social studies teacher, well, history teacher at the high school level that will be teaching it. And um, I know that when we were trying to figure out, could we get this launched by the spring? That was one of the things we wanted to make sure was that there was like this resource from DPI. But I would love if you would be able to email me some information. Sure. I think you said eighth grade. As well, did you say eighth grade? Yes, eighth grade social sciences, American history one, American history two, and civics and economics. That would be great if you would email that to me because right now that's just at the high school level and uh -huh. begin to integrate it into middle school as well. I think that would be very powerful. Wonderful, will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Additional questions. Okay, great, great job. Thank you so much. Uh, let's hear from the Chapel Hill Schools. Yes, thank you very much. And Dana, I admire your passion. And that was, that was wonderful. I'm going to present uh, Lee Williams, who's our Director of Equity. And before I turn it over to him, I'll let all of you know that we're losing Lee. He is leaving us at the end of the month going to Guilford County. That's uh, so a middle school principal. Uh, he apparently loves that and wants to get back to us. So we're going to miss him. He's going to be a great loss to us. But Lee, would you uh, uh, catch us up on equity in Chapel Carver City Schools? Yes, sir, I will. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, uh, there's not much left to be said from my partner, Dr. Keeling, um, has said a lot of the same things. We collaborate a lot together. So a lot of the things that she hit on around um, the grant that we received with Pacific, uh, I mean, from Orange County, and we use that with Pacific Education um, Group to do beyond diversity training. We have the opportunity to start this summer. We trained all of our administrators with REI training, then also with Courageous Conversations. We did another round of Courageous Conversations for our ITFs um, and technology facilitators, our gifted ed specialists, our program facilitators, looking at roughly 160 educators that work within our building who support teachers. So a lot of the same work was done. I won't be redundant on um, what Dr. Keeling said as she spoke about the um, 
advisory council for Orange County. We have one for Chapel Hill, the EAC Equity Advisory uh, Council that is actually meeting on October 5th. Um, we have a staff of color that we've done affinity groups with, especially when you're, you're dealing with racial turmoil and the murdering of George Floyd, the murdering of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, there needed to be some healing work that was done. We also did this work with our students um, in Chapel Hill as well, K through 12. Uh, we were excited about, about that work. Um, as we think about sort of what's happened um, with this reopening and, and COVID situation, um, the reopening school committees utilize the racial equity impact assessment. So much like Dr. Keeling was mentioning to make sure that every decision is made with that racial lens in mind. So we don't make decisions in isolation that have barriers in place. How do we remove a good just of those barriers? If not all, um, we use that lens for every decision that makes sure it's equitable. We ensured that students were participating on the reentry committees as well to highlight that student voice piece. Um, from there, we're actually really excited. We had some students in one of our spaces, Wiley, that actually created podcasts, and they had a news article around that. So if you haven't checked out the Carboro podcast from some of our students, they talk about their fear of COVID, what their teachers need to know when they reenter into the space about what they've dealt with as students of color, along with the racial tension that they've dealt with. So I guess y'all check it out. It's really cool. Um, our equity specialists have been working this and will be working this year to make sure that as we're thinking about this virtual space, we also still consider it with a racial equity lens and a lens to dismantle and remove barriers. Um, we are fortunate to have four equity specialists, two elementary, one middle and one high school. Here are a list of some of their courses that they'll be doing this year. Um, trajectory to identity, community, equity and social justice. We use a 27 equitable classroom practices framework that's also tied into our community code and character of support. I know Dr. Banks is going to get me if I mess that name up, um, but it's also how do we build the equity centered classroom. All that work is tied together. We'll also have a session on how we talk about race and the intersectionality as a compass and then utilizing this idea that my protest is my pedagogy. And so we'll keep these frameworks in place. This is our support for teachers um, with some professional development. And then equity is all of our work and how we stay connected together. So we'll continue to collaborate with our student services and providing professional development, especially around the building um, equity center classrooms. And I know there'll be a report to our board um, in October around this work. And we're also gonna have more training in October for how we create more equity center classrooms with the idea of this racial equity lens also thinking how we do this in a virtual space. And then I'll leave you with this lasting quote. Um, not everything is that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And that comes from the great words of James Baldwin. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the Chapel Hill Equity Program. Okay, I don't see anything. That means you did a good job, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> And good luck in Guilford. We'll miss you. Blessings. Thank you so much. Positive vibes to you all. All right. Um, chairs, do you want to um, say anything before we um, leave this evening? Marianne and Hillary? Sure. I just would like to thank everyone. Um, it's amazing, really, to hear all that is happening and even these challenging times, how so much of the good work is continuing. Um, I also know there's a lot of work we all want to do, but it's always refreshing when we come together because you, like once again, we really do have a common goal for what we want for our children and our communities. And so I just thank you all for the energy and the work that goes into this tonight, but also every day. And hopefully um, we'll be able to continue, uh, I guess more, I don't want to say normal because we don't know what we've learned that we might take back, but um, you know, to continue to move back towards um, at least being able to have our students in our schools and also working together. So thank you all so much. Same. I'll just um, echo what Marianne said, just deep gratitude for the conversation and the collaboration tonight. Um, also a big thank you to the commissioners for helping us with our hotspots. That is incredibly helpful given our situation. So thank you, thank you, and um, looking forward to continued collaboration. Great, Commissioner Dorson or Mark. Yes, um, are, it, can we just ask a parting questions? If sure. there's a so the la I think it's the last time we met all together, which maybe was six months ago, but it seems like a hundred years ago. Um, I, you know, that at that time, there was a lot of discussion with Chapel Hill about um, 
you know, issues with contracting. And I think there was going to be some kind of internal investigation that was going to go forward. And I, I don't know if that got completed, but if it did, is there a final report? Is there any kind of um, final summary or progress report that can be shared with the commissioners? I can, sure. I, can um, I can tell you where it is. Marianne, you want to comment or you want me to? Oh, I was just going to share that we are, um, the external review is, um, I believe, what we're talking about has been just recently completed, but actually pretty close to on schedule. And we will be having a separate board meeting um, in order to uh, receive those findings and to discuss it um, with the community. So, um, so that actually was able to stay pretty much on schedule, um, thanks to the, you know, the work of the able to get all the information we needed. So Dr. Cosby, did you have anything else more specific? No, you said exactly what I was going to say. That that meeting is scheduled for October 8th and Mark, Thank it'll you. be it'll be announced and will be virtual. And then that report will be posted. Thank you. All right, we have a question from uh, Mark Markopoulos. Not a question, but a, a comment and a suggestion. I really appreciate the fact that Apparently the schools are nimble enough to switch their 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 courses offered to include African American and Latinx and Native American history. And I would add one more that I think is really important if y'all can figure out a way to fit it in. And that is a course on local government. You know, people learn about I know when when I was in uh, you know seventh and eighth grade, you know, we learned about federal government and state government and never learned about local government. And people have, you, know, you all know, people have no idea what we do, right? They don't know what the school boards do. They certainly don't know what the commissioners do. And it would be a really interesting uh, course for, for students to take and, and it would be a great contribution to our community. So I would urge y'all to consider a, a, a course or two in local government. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. I would also add to that um, to add some sort of women's studies classes in there if you if your students are interested in that, because um, I think you know that, that the, you start getting to that when you're in college. But I, I bet um, some high school students would really um, love to learn a little bit more um, about women's histories. Um, Sally Green. Yeah, I just want to say based on following Mark's comment, there are also. Um, Courses on local government found at Carolina Public Humanities already ready made. So I know about women's studies, but we can find out. You got you covered. Yeah, but I, I want to add women's studies to that. Sally, you better get in touch with them. Tell them to add women's studies to that. Um, all right, let's see, Earl McKee. Yes, I appreciate the invitation from both systems to take a look at the new facility improvements uh, for Chapel Carborough specifically. I spent about a year as the on-site inspector for the greenway that terminates there uh, adjacent to the school. And, uh, and during that year was when the effective destruction happened. So I'm very interested in seeing what the construction looks like. All right. I don't see any more hands. All right, I still encourage everyone, please be safe, wear masks, stay your distance, wash your hands, carry your hand, hand sanitizer, and um, you know, speak to everyone and tell them to continue to do it. Uh, we, we, are, uh, we know that on October 2nd, the governor is gonna come back on with um, some sort of change to his executive order. We don't have any idea what that's gonna be yet. Um, usually we get, a, we get a little bit of a notice a couple of days in advance. Um, right now we, we know nothing. We don't know if he's gonna to go to phase three. Um, we know that he has encouraged schools to do their best to open, but um, that's up to you guys. You don't, I don't think you need to be pressured to do anything you don't wanna do. Um, uh, and you know, w let us know if we can help you in any way. We're here for you. And everyone have a really, really good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you all. Good night.